removing this. Yeah, you want to remove it, and I'll, I'll just do the clipping. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Carmelo Ragusa. And my name is Tariq Elahi. And uh, we both work at SAP, SAP, and uh, primarily focus on bare metal as a service. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, we're going to present the work that we've been doing uh, in, uh, in this context. And uh, we, first, we're going to kind of give a quick uh, overview on how this fits uh, in uh, all SAP plan of moving into OpenStack. Uh, and the presentation then will focus mostly on the bare metal as a service. Um, in terms of content audience, uh, we think that uh, the type of work that we've been doing can be beneficial for uh, either small companies or enterprises that can share the same type of requirements. Um, so we're going to go through quickly this uh, quick background on SAP, what we call, call converged cloud plan. And then we show the current in house solution that we've been, uh, we developed and we are using in production. Uh, then we uh, focus on the enterprise requirements that uh, uh, we are relevant for us. Uh, we, do, we go after in the open stack evaluation, so to gather what uh, uh, were our fundings in that. Um, and then how we actually integrate uh, the uh, Hironic into our bare metal solution. And then we show some of the future work. So currently in SAP, uh, there are lots of different clouds. Um, so they are kind of silos. They are self-contained, they work on their own. But there is already a plan in place and we are moving uh, um, towards a, a single um, solution. Uh, so OpenStack is at the bottom of that uh, to manage uh, all the different type of uh, hardware. Um, and then we have all the various applications that we have uh, that can be using uh, some pass solution, application that can call directly OpenStack, uh, and applications that can use uh, some in-house um, layers platforms. So how our bare metal work fits into this? Because uh, some of the uh, applications, uh, they need this type of uh, um, solution. So currently in SAP, as I said, we are moving into, into this uh, uh, solution, which we call the converged cloud. Now, um, Maybe some of you already heard about uh, SAP HANA. Um, just quickly, HANA is an in-memory database uh, and allows you to uh, load all the um, customer data into the memory. And from there, you can do uh, analytics and this uh, interesting stuff. Um, HANA works with uh, mostly with uh, large um, RAM footprints, so in terms, in terms of like terabytes of RAM. And so in order to have uh, HANA working uh, in a cloud setup, we have two different uh, um, aspects that we were taking care of. The first one is uh, the, what we call the cloud cell, HANA cloud cell, and is from the infrastructure point of view where we have standardized the, the different type of hardware and how it has to be uh, combined together. So we have one part, which is the compute. You can see it pretty straightforward. There are different, uh, um, uh, different switches. Uh, you can have uh, different type of networks or two for management and for the normal actual customer uh, networks. And those nodes are highly dense in RAM because, as I said, HANA normal uh, deployments are uh, in that order. And then we have separately a storage rack where uh, all the storage is uh, uh, kept. Um, 
So this is, this is what we use uh, to uh, provision uh, HANA landscapes. And this is, uh, allows us to have uh, optimized performance, uh, scalability, reliability, uh, and security. The other aspects, uh, the other aspect that we have instead is the software that allows it to um, deploy in this uh, landscape, uh, infrastructure, sorry. It's called the Cloud Frame Manager, and uh, mm, it basically allows you to uh, manage the life cycle of uh, your HANA landscapes. So you have a customer that uh, needs to have uh, a, what we call a frame. Uh, in this frame, which is made of one or more nodes, you need to deploy uh, your HANA. And our uh, in-house solution allows you to do that. And it manages all the low-level uh, resources, so storage, networking, servers, and so on. I mean, and this is great, this works fine, but of course, there are some kind of limitations in the long run. And so when we started to think about moving forward, we said, okay, let's look at what is, if you can have something that is open, not just in house. And so we started to think about in terms of what kind of requirements do we need if we want to go that direction. And so the first one, of course, is uh, the ability to uh, manage your bare metal infrastructure. So you need to be able to do that uh, in, in terms of uh, servers, uh, uh, network, uh, storage, and so on. So you need to have a solution that allows that. We have it in house, but we want something that is open. That is because, um, and it links to the second bullet points, if we want to bring in new vendors, uh, at the moment what we have to do is uh, writing uh, new software that allows you to do configuration for that new vendor. The more they come in, the more we want to use it, the more we have to do that, we, well, we have to maintain, and so on. On the other end, we don't want to be locked just on a single vendor. So we want to be able to detach from that and rely on something that kind of go on its own. It's the vendor itself that writes that part, and you just leverage on that. Um, the other requirement was to have open API, so open interfaces that are just accepted, that they are used, and uh, so we can just rely on those. Another important aspect uh, is multi-tenancy. So multi-tenancy in, uh, in cloud you have through VMs, bare metal is kind of easy, you give a box just to uh, a, sing, a, a user. But there is also the multi-tenancy in terms of networking. So when you provision a, a, a server, you want to be able to use a, a tenant network. You don't want to, you want those to be separated for each tenant that you have in your landscape. So that was something that is really important for us. That you achieve it obviously by using things like VLAN, VXLAN, and so on. So what we were looking needed to have that type of features. Uh, we also needed to have network reliability. So we have reliability in terms of uh, uh, servers, in terms of storage, but we wanted also to have in terms of network. So what that means is uh, that uh, you have uh, um, multiple networks that are bonded together and that if one fails, uh, you still be able to carry on your provisioning. And finally, we wanted to be able to support uh, multiple deployment models. So you can have uh, local uh, deployment, local boot, you can have uh, NFS root, uh, and so on. So these were the requirements that uh, were important for, for us. So when we started to look uh, on what we could use, uh, uh, of course, OpenStack was uh, one of the um, most uh, uh, wanted candidates for that. 
So in our evaluation, we realized that out of the box, we could already have uh, things like uh, the active support of multiple vendors. Is there each vendor that come in, in the OpenStack community wants its uh, hardware supported? He does the development of whatever is his plugin and so on. So that uh, is, uh, it kind of tick the box there for us. Um, we have standardized API, of course, and that's, uh, that's uh, easy, is accepted in OpenStack, uh, is there and it works uh, fine with us. Multiple deployment model. In there, we, we didn't have the local boot, CFM, our in-house solution does NFS rule. So we wanted to, we had in our plans to have a local boot and uh, Ironic supported that out of the box. So it was a good thing for us um, to be able to use that feature right away. And the other thing which it's, it's very relevant, it's very important, we wanted to have an active community because you can have the solution as best as possible, but if you don't have support behind that, you're gonna be there stuck many times. And we found that uh, um, the community in OpenStack is great. Uh, in term, we've been act uh, actively engaging with the community in terms of new features and bugs and so on. And we just, like, I mean, there is just an example over there. A bug report uh, in IPA, patch committed just within a few hours, which is great. I mean, if you think about it, you find something that doesn't work, talk with somebody that uh, knows what he has to do, and he just fix it. Um, and also, the last bullet is uh, the ability to have ironic in standalone mode. Why that? Because our in-house solution is already working, is in production, we cannot right away bring all the functionalities that are there in OpenStack. We want to do it gradually. And so the ability to just use a single component for that, it was quite important for us. Because right now we have a solution that we've been integrating Ironic, that it's working, it's out there. So, in, in our evaluation, we then come up with a number of findings, right? The right support. Uh, we, we needed to have uh, um, rating capabilities because what CFM does during the uh, uh, provisioning, it uh, configured the node with the exact rate support that, uh, that you need. And we needed that. So, Although at the time it wasn't there for Ironic, but we, it was nice to, to know that they already were working in that direction. <coughs> Multi-tenant networking. So Ironic, <laughs> up to now, have been only supporting flat networks. So there was no the possibility of having and using uh, VLANs. Um, Although Neutron supported that, there was no integration between Neutron and Ironic. Uh, but we've been working with the community and this, that was a shortcut. We changed it into a, a feature. Um, I'm talking about that later on. Um, one of the things, for example, right now is the, at the moment, Ironic doesn't support NFS root. Uh, it's something that uh, we are kind of working with, and perhaps in the future we may contribute it. Um, one of the things, just a comment about the logging, it can be a bit difficult. At times, you need to go through many, uh, many files, but it's the way it is, is there. Yeah, just on the, on the logging, it, it, Another aspect of was that the we wanted to integrate um, OpenStack components with CFM. It has its own logging components, and we wanted to be able to, if we trigger a provisioning workflow, we wanted to make sure that we can integrate all the relevant logging entries from the OpenStack component into the, the CFM workflow, so we can see if something goes wrong, 
which what happened in there are then going to look into the log files we can see at the CFM so, so this this point refers to integration of the backend OpenStack logging capabilities into the CFM logging capabilities mm -hmm. so and uh, as Kamal said to me log files it could be difficult to actually go find out where the exact um, issue is but we wanted to integrate that into the CFM logging so we can relate to a specific provisioning transaction that we triggered from the um, CFM. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and the last uh, bullet is, uh, at the time of the evaluation that we were doing, there was no hardware discovery. But this actually then come up as a nice, another feature in, uh, in Ironic and is already there. So now how we've been going for the integration. As I said, because you didn't want to go and integrate right away all the uh, OpenStack uh, um, components, uh, we went uh, for integrating only, uh, I ironic only, in standalone mode. Uh, the way we did it was by wrapping up the uh, ironic API calls uh, so that they could use the, in a CFM asynchronously. That's because when CFM gets a request to create a frame, it creates a kind of a plan, and that plan, yeah, there are many different tasks. So because we wanted to be able to create a task for uh, uh, Ironic, we needed to have this kind of uh, um, approach. The other things instead, like uh, discovery, networking, uh, and image provisioning. We just kept the one that we had developed in CFM. If you move on. So the discovery was done through CFM. CFM has a, um, a discovery script. So once you boot it, uh, this discovery script starts. It collects the node information. And then what we do, we use that node information uh, from CFM, which invokes uh, Hyronic uh, uh, to create a node and using that type of information that has just collected. Then once it gets a reply back with the UID, we store that UID uh, in CFM databases so that that can be used later on for any other operations. Pretty simple, it's nothing uh, um, fancy there. Um, the other part instead is when we do the deployment, uh, once we kick off the deployment, uh, we use the uh, Ironic Python agent to do the bare metal node configuration. So we do like RAID configuration and writing the image to the disk. Um, and then after that, in order to do the node customization, we use cloud in it. And CFM uh, dynamically generates the config drive and user data. Uh, for cloud in it. So, as a future work, so this is what we've been doing uh, so far. And as I said, uh, this is something that is already implemented and integrated in our solution and is in production. It's used as a future work. Um, we've been working with the community. I was saying that uh, earlier about the neutron and ironic integration. Um, this is something that uh, uh, apparently many uh, companies or anyway, open stack users who wanted to have and is the ability of when you do a provisioning of a node to use uh, the tenant network. We'll be doing that work in the community and uh, with, mm, jointly with Arista. Uh, and now this work uh, is uh, uh, in Mitaka. Um, of course, we need to integrate with uh, um, Keystone for authentication authorization. And this is mostly because if you think about the uh, cloud, converged cloud plan that we showed at the beginning, that work will go into the whole SAP um, uh, infrastructure. It means that we are going to use uh, uh, 
more open stack components and so we will need to integrate with Keystone which will be served in the, in the context of, of the converged cloud. The other thing that we've been working is about the, uh, the discovery. So we had our own discovery but we want to leverage the uh, ironic inspector one. Um, and so we've been already doing some, some internal work in order to integrate our own discovery and uh, ironic one in, and using just a single RAM disk that can decide which one to use at the uh, provisioning time. Uh, we've also been looking at uh, um, NOVA in terms of the uh, scheduling, availability zone, affinity, anti-affinity, and so on. This because we need somehow a way to have a bit more control on that. Reason is that uh, HANA can be, can have multiple nodes, for example, and depending on uh, customers' uh, requirements, you may need to have a rack specific that you want to push specific HANA instances into with the same rack. And so we've been looking uh, into Nova to uh, use some of that capabilities. Uh, and finally, uh, the, the use of uh, NFS root. As I was saying, we've been working on that uh, to integrate it uh, uh, with uh, uh, Ironic. And that could be done by decoupling uh, the deployment and the boot, booting operations. At the moment, when you do that, in Ironic, when you do a provisioning, it's just a single operation. But if we are able to decouple that, we can just do the boot from NFS root and then from there it just take care of itself. And we have something that is uh, almost there and eventually we might decide to push that back to the community. Um, and I think... I think that's it, yeah. Yeah. We can take questions if there are any questions. I think I yeah, need to use the microphone. Hi, great, great to see Ironic Connection. Uh, could you please elaborate on the RAID configuration? Uh, do you do it uh, during the deployment itself or sometime in advance? And do you have some uniform RAID configuration or it's uh, varies per instance? Um, so we do it in during the provisioning workflow, so that's where uh, our requirement was a bit different than Ironic, because Ironic do that, does that in the cleaning phase whereas we want to do that during the provisioning phase. And so in, we have some developments ongoing where we are using the target RAID config still to specify what RAID information we want to do, but we have a custom hardware manager in IPA that actually triggers that during the provisioning. And, and then we also wanted to have the capability so we can specify different types of RAID depending on the workload, because different workloads might require different types of RAIDing. And so we're still using um, some aspects of ironic, but other than relying on the cleaning based rating, we're doing it in the, during the provisioning workflow. Okay, thank you. Other questions? No? Okay. Thank That's you very fine. much for attending. <laughs> thank you.